Good morning, church. We're glad to be with you today on this Facebook Live broadcast, and we want to welcome all of our internet audience, which seems to be growing every single week. More and more people are tuning in and and uh, watching us, or at least catching the the stream, you know, after it's uh, done being live. And we just want to say thank you to all of those who are sharing this out on social media, and uh, that is such a blessing today. Well, I just wonder, are you ready for the Word? I've got a, a, a message for you today that I believe will encourage you and give you a sense of purpose during this time that we are all in. Uh, anyway, I want to talk to you about an interesting debate that's been going on in our culture. Uh, our culture has asked the question, is the church essential? Is the church essential, an, an essential institution in a, in a modern society? And obviously, for anybody who is a Bible-believing Christian, the answer to that would be yes, that it is extremely essential. And so I want to just jump into the Word today by looking at who the head of the church is, because if the head is important, I believe the institution is important. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 22 and 23 says this, and he put all things under his feet and gave him, speaking of Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, Jesus is the head of the church. And although the church is an organization, someone once rightly said that the church is also an organism, right? Christ is the head. We are his body. You can look at your hands today. They can be the hands of Jesus. Your voice can be the voice of Jesus. Your feet can bring Jesus' message. And I think the very fact that Jesus is the ultimate head of the church makes the church essential. Now, I'm the first to say, due to the current crisis, that it is not essential that we gather together in large groups. Uh, we can worship God online and teach the Word of God online, but here's the point today. Just because we are not meeting publicly, that does not diminish our capacity to have a positive effect on our society. In fact, if anything, this situation, I believe, has caused the church to wake up spiritually. We're having a greater effect on society because thousands of churches are now online and there's a curiosity factor. People are checking those things out and clicking on them. And so if there's a lesson to be learned in this situation, it is that not being at church doesn't diminish who we are in Christ at all. We are still the church. We are salt in an unsavory world, light in a dark world of despair. We are able to worship God in our homes and pray and love each other by calling and caring for one another. But I want to say something long and loud today. The church of Jesus Christ is definitely essential to our society. And the good news is that the church will stand until the trumpet sounds and we are are called home. The church is about 2,000 years old, and we have went through a lot of things. We've been burned at the stake, fed to lions, went through world wars. We've been misunderstood, misrepresented, and persecuted. But guess what? The church of Jesus Christ is still here alive and walking in victory. I love the description that Paul gives to young Timothy of the church. He speaks of the household of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. I want to tell you that in times of trouble or in times of prosperity, coronavirus or no coronavirus, people straying from God or people running to God, may the church of Jesus Christ stand forever as the pillar and the ground of truth. So let me answer the question today. How essential is the church? I'm going to give you three reasons why the church is essential. Number one, the church is essential because we hold the key to the spiritual healing of our land. Now, I don't want you to miss what I'm saying here. I am so grateful to be in the United States of America. And I know, I know that many are looking to the government to do what is necessary in this moment. And, and the government is doing what it can. And I pray for God. The, I, I, 
I pray for and ask God to give wisdom to the task force and the president and the, and the governors. And I am grateful for our government. I don't even pretend to understand everything that having to do with the economy and the stimulus packages and all that. But government has a role to play. And I'm grateful for the medical profession. Doctors, nurses, hospital aides, EMTs, those who are developing vaccines and making ventilators. There is no group that has been more heroic at this time. They've worked tirelessly, and the medical profession has a role, and I'm grateful for society as a whole, for every person wearing a face mask, for every family practicing social distancing. I believe it's all making a difference, and I honestly believe with God's help, we will overcome. But I want the world and the church to understand something, that we have a role to play. Uh, it's an important role, and I think even more important than the government or doctors. Now, I'm not diminishing them. I, I appreciate them, but I also appreciate the church because, you see, the church can look beyond the crisis of the moment to the spiritual state and the condition of the nation as a whole. Will we defeat this disease? Yes, I believe we will. We're going to work together and fight and overcome this disease. I fully believe that the economy is going to open back up. But and, and one day things are going to have the semblance of normalcy once again. But the question in my mind is, are we just going to defeat the coronavirus or will the nation of the United States of America return to God? Will the people of our land be turning to the Lord, or will we simply go back to living our lives in a kind of a normal routine status quo way? That is my great concern and what I've been praying about. I've never forgotten the Sundays after 9-11. Churches were filled for two to three weeks, and everything then after that just went back to normal. I, I don't want that following this crisis. My prayer is that the church will not go back to normal. And so the church has a role to play if we would dare to step into it and believe God. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 13 talks of moments when disease comes, when pestilence is ravaging the land. It describes perfectly the scenario and the situation that our world is in. And then in the very next verse, God gives the church some powerful instruction. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And there's a role for the church to play in all of this because it says, God says, if my people, it doesn't say if the president or the Congress or the medical profession, it says if the people of God, if those who know God, if the people who belong to Christ, if they will step into their God-given role and do what is required, God has a great promise for the world. He says, I will hear and forgive and heal the land. And I know that there are some people of God who are listening to me right now, people who go by his name, and we need to ask the question, what is the role that we have? What's our responsibility in all of this? The government's doing what they can. The medical profession is doing what they can. The factories making ventilators are doing what they can. The stimulus package will do what it can. But will the church of Jesus Christ step into this incredibly important role and do what we need to do? There are four things that are enumerated here in this verse that outlines our role when pestilences are in our land. Number one, first of all, we're to humble ourselves. Now, we're a proud people in the United States of America. In our culture, there's kind of an underlying sense of self-reliance. We're a can-do people. We have money and insurance and cars and homes and plenty of food. It's almost as though we don't need God. In fact, I, I, I believe that most Americans have no idea how much they need God. And most churchgoers don't need know how much the church needs God. Because here's the truth. This is what the Word says. It says, without him, we can do nothing. And it's a humble stance to say that. 
If all I have to depend upon are my best efforts, I can assure you that I'm going to fail. Because you see, Bob cannot save anyone. The arm of flesh will not produce what only God is able to produce. Because you see, a church can have the best sound system and, and wonderful lights and a beautiful sanctuary and a slick program. But I want you to hear me today that if God doesn't show up in the house or through the live broadcast, it's not going to produce the effect that we need and knowing that my friends we need to humble ourselves and say God we need you the proud say we can do this on our own but the humble say Lord we are completely dependent upon you it takes humility and the church must begin to humble themselves number two we're to pray now, I'm not just talking about blessing the food before we eat. That's a great idea. But we have to pray like our grandparents prayed in World War I and World War II. We have to really intercede. We have to ask God to strengthen our faith. We have to ask God to send a move of His Spirit. We have to ask God to bring a revival to this land. The question is, do we take the spiritual condition of our family and friends and co-workers to heart. Years ago, a pastor by the name, I heard a pastor by the name of Jackson Senyanga. He was from Uganda and he told short stories that were, were tremendous. He spoke of the church during the desperate years when that country was under the reign of a cruel dictator by the name of Idi Amin. The churches were burned. Christianity was outlawed. Christians were persecuted. People were executed for no reason whatsoever. Man's inhumanity to man is incredible. And so the people of God, in desperation, began to pray. He's told how they would go out into the jungle and gather in groups of two and three and call out on God. Sometimes they would stay out there for days on end and one would have to watch because, while the others prayed because to be caught praying was certain death. And that was all that the church could do. And I'm telling you the good news is that God heard their cry. Hedi Amin was ultimately overthrown and after that a great revival swept across that country and the churches were literally filled to overflowing with people turning to God and the joy uh, th that God had answered because people had prayed was incredible and now I want to tell you something we are not that desperate and I'm grateful for that but listen we don't need for things to get that desperate that's why we need to step into our role as a church and pray now while we have an opportunity, while we're sheltering in our homes, let's really pray. The scripture says we do not have because we do not ask. And I tell you, I'm not just asking for coronavirus to be taken away, but I'm asking for God's church to be strengthened. And I'm asking that there would come a spiritual awakening in this land that so desperately needs God. And then number three, we're to seek his face. We're not to seek his hand. You know, God help us, this can't be about money. I'm grateful for His hand. His hand has supplied us everything that we've ever needed. You know, we found Him to be faithful all of our lives. But I'm going to tell you something. God wants us to deepen our relationship with Him during this time. To get to know Him better. So that we can hear His still, small voice speak to us and tell us what to, to do. Because you see, it is out of our personal relationship with God that God moves. Now is the time to get to know God better. And then number four, we are to turn from our wicked ways. The tendency that the church has is to look out into a world that doesn't know God and doesn't follow God and doesn't l listen to God and say, you know, if they would stop all of that, then our land would be healed. Let me tell you something. That's not what the Word says. It says if my people would do this. It says that we need to take a personal inventory of our lives and we're to stop anything in our lives that isn't pleasing to God. The Scripture is very clear that we're 
we're to repent. That means change the way that we think. Go in another direction. Turn away from our sins to the living God and cleanse ourselves from anything that doesn't please Him. And the Bible tells us this, that if we'll do those four things, those four incredible things, that's the role of the church in this hour. God says this. He says, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will hear their land. I'm believing for a great move of God following this crisis. I'm believing that churches will be packed out and people will come and find out that there is a living God who's powerful and real and available to anyone. The church is essential. Let me give you the second reason. Number two, we reveal Christ to the world. We are his hands and his feet and his voice. And there's no greater time for the church to shine than right now. 22 million people have lost their job. Thousands are coming down sick. Fear is paralyzing many people in our world. The future is uncertain. But now is the time for you and me to shine because you see the world needs hope. And I've got good news today. You and I have the hope that the world needs. And his name is Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 describes the church. It says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. The church has a special role in society. The Bible tells us that we're a chosen generation. And I believe that in God's sovereignty, God has allowed this, this virus to go around the world in this very moment. Why? Because he knew he had a people who had been called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. And He knew that they would proclaim His praises. Come on, right in the middle of the storm, right in the midst of the darkest hour, I, by faith I see it and I can hear it. A song is going to rise up out of the people of God. It's rising up out of living rooms. It's rising up out of bedrooms at night. It's rising up as people go for walks with, with their headphones on. They're praising and they're worshiping God. God's people are still praising Him. In fact, we are magnifying Him in this hour. We are lifting Him up high for all the world to see that, 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 that the, our message to the world is that they need Jesus. We are revealing Him. We're saying to the world, let not your heart be troubled. Don't worry. There's a God that's in control. There's a God who can heal. There's a God that can be trusted. You see, there was a time in our lives when we were not a people. We were just individuals out drifting through the world doing our own thing. We had not yet obtained mercy. But oh, in the sovereign goodness and love of God, He called us. Aren't you grateful for that? He chose us. Aren't you thankful? He redeemed us. How many of you love Him? Mercy came. Grace came. Forgiveness came. And we became a people, a chosen generation. And now the Scripture says that we're a royal priesthood. You want to know what a priesthood does? A priesthood intercedes between the people and Almighty God. And I'll tell you, that is our job as we plead for our nation. We're a holy nation. His own own special people and we have a message for the world if you want peace in your life Jesus is peace if you want hope in your life Jesus is hope if you want freedom in your life whom the sun sets free is free indeed if you want joy he is joy unspeakable and full of glory and I believe that the church is essential because, you see, we pump massive amounts of faith and positivity into our culture. Why? Because we declare Jesus. Why is the church important? Because God has left us here to reveal His Son to the world. Even as Jesus revealed God when He was on the earth. As the current, as the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth, we are the current expression of Jesus Christ in the world. 
until he comes. Man, that is a staggering job description. Nothing could be of greater importance. Maybe today you're watching this broadcast and you've been turned off by bad experience in churches that were institutional where God dwelled only in name but not in reality. Listen, you need to get a, a new vision of what God intends for His church and we need to make it happen right here so that people will say, I have seen the living God dwelling among His people. The great composer Giacomo Puccini, whose opera is number among the world's favorite was stricken with cancer in 1922. But he was determined to write a final opera, Turandot, which some consider his very best. His students implored him to rest to save his strength, but he persisted, remarking at one point, if I do not finish my music, my students will finish it. 1924, Puccini was taken to Brussels to be operated on. He died there two days after his surgery, but his students did finish his work. In 1926, the gala premiere was held in Milan under the baton of Puccini's favorite student, Arturo Toscanini. All went brilliantly that evening until they came to the point in the score where the master had been forced to put his pen down. And Toscanini, his face wet with tears, stopped the production, put down his baton, turned to the audience and cried out, Thus far, the master wrote, but he died. And after a few moments, his face now wreathed in a smile. Toscanini picked up his baton and cried out again, but his disciples finished his work. Last week, we celebrated the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Our master died. He was raised from the dead and ascended into the Father. And he has left to us the most important task in the world, to finish his work, to proclaim his salvation among the nations. But to do it, each one of us must commit ourselves to a living relationship with the living God. We must commit ourselves to one another as members of God's household. We must commit ourselves to know and live by and defend God's word of truth. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but I want to show Jesus to the one in front of me. Come on, let's reveal Jesus to the world and finish his work. Jesus said, I've got to do the works of him who sent me while it is day because the night is coming when no man can work. Fortunately, we can continue his work. And there's a third reason why the church is essential, number three, because we provide a healing community full of love. I want to quote today a pastor in Chicago, Illinois. He's not from our denomination, nor do I really follow all that he says and does, but he does make this powerful statement about the church. His name is Bill Hybels. He said this, there is nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. It comforts the grieving and heals the broken in the context of community. It builds bridges to seekers and offers truth to the confused. It provides resources for those in need and opens its arms to the forgotten, the downtrodden, and the disillusioned. It breaks the chains of addictions, frees the oppressed, and offers belonging to the marginalized of this world. Whatever the capacity for human suffering, the church has a greater capacity for healing and wholeness. Still to this day, the potential of the local church is almost more than I can grasp. No other organization on earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. The church is a place where anyone can come and be healed. Now most people have heard of the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus told this powerful story of a man who's traveling and winds up getting robbed and beaten. It's a tragic story. He's left on the side of the road to perish and die. He really cannot save himself. And along comes a priest, but the priest is too busy, and he passes him by. And a Levite comes by, and he has too many religious duties, and so he passes him by. And so finally, a man, one who's despised by society, a Samaritan comes by, and he does the right thing. Luke 10, 34 says this. It says, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. 
Then he put the man on his own donkey. Notice what it says. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. Of course, if you read the rest of the parable, it is implied that the man found complete restoration and healing in the comfort of the inn. Now, one of the striking aspects of early Christian interpretations of Scripture is a tendency to understand the biblical text in relationship to the church, whereas today we're inclined to read Scripture in very individualistic terms. Early Christians were inclined to read Scripture more in corporate terms. They were eager to discern what a particular text had to say about the nature of the church. And so St. Augustine, one of the early leaders in, in the early church, comments on the story of the Good Samaritan, and this is what he wrote. He said, let us be carried to the end to be healed. And see, while modern readers are likely to focus on the Samaritan's heroic compassion, Augustine focuses on the role the church plays in the healing of the wounded man. And the Samaritan brings the wounded man to the end. And if you remember the story, he gives the innkeeper two denarii to continue looking after the man. And those often overlooked details were no small matter for Augustine. Though figurative interpretation, they lead him to a reflection on the church. Because you see, for Augustine, the end is a symbol of the church. For the church is the community where Christ, the physician, heals wounded people. Augustine's comments on this famous story result in a powerful image of the church because you see the church is the place of healing. The church is where people who are wounded by sin can experience Christ's healing grace. Maybe today you're watching this and uh, somewhere around the world and you're not really a Christian, you've never really been to church, I implore you, I encourage you to find your way to a Bible-believing church, to continue watching until this crisis is over and find your way to a church because, because the, the church is a place of healing. And one thing is certain about this image of the church, the church is not peripheral to salvation. Indeed, it is necessary for salvation. Because without the end, the wounded man would not have been hailed. Without the church, we would not experience Christ's love and acceptance and healing. You know, though Augustine was clear that the church is not perfect, and I can assure you there is no perfect church in the world, along with the Christians of his time, he believed that the church was the community what God indwells. And thus it is the single place of salvation in the world. I just tell you, I believe in the church of Jesus Christ. And I've seen the healing, restorative power of the church. In a church that loves like Jesus, it's a place where you can come with your faults and your failures and your brokenness, your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups. And usually there's a safe place and a safe person that you can talk to. And you can say, this is who I really am and this is what I really struggled with. And these are the sins where I have failed. And you won't receive words of judgment. You'll be met with grace. People who will say, it's okay. God loves you. He can help you. He can help you change. Come on. I believe that the church is essential to our world. Just ask the man who failed in his marriage. and He and his wife were loved on by the people in the church. And yeah, he, he, they went through a hard time, but God helped them through the counsel of others to forgive one another. They made it through that rough patch, and today they're stronger than they've ever been in their home and in their marriage. Ask the single mom who is struggling to pay the bills and struggling with loneliness and heartache, but a family came along and helped her get her car fixed and adopted her and loved her kids as though they were her grand, their grandkids. Or ask the teen who needed encouragement after his dad died and some youth leader or ranger leader came along and put his arms around him and said, it's going to be okay and helped them walk through it and took them to the ball game and taught them how to how to throw a baseball and hit the ball and all those important things. Or 
Ask the thousands upon thousands who went to a celebrate recovery program and as they walked through the door hurting and broken and as they shared their hurts and habits that first night the tears ran down their cheek and a year later they walk out of that program and they know that work the steps and they're doing so much better and ask the hundreds of thousands of people who've been recipients of those who came and said you know I just really want to make amends with you today I'm sorry for Give me. Ask the senior who is at home and feels so lonely and not even her own children or grandchildren call. But yet there's that one person in the church, that one lady who's, who, who's kind of adopted her. And she calls every week and she takes her to dinner and brings a meal once in a while. Ask the millions of people who've attended church who can tell you of a moment where they were about ready to throw in the towel and quit. And yet the pastor or the evangelist or somebody in the church said something, my friend, and it caused them to make the right decision at the right time. Or ask the mom who's struggling with knowledge on how to discipline her kids. And an older lady comes and in just a gentle conversation but nudges that, that mom in the right direction. I, I can tell you, my friend, that the church has value it is essential to society how many good deeds are done in the name of Jesus how many hospital beds are visited by believers how many funeral dinners have been served by churches in this last decade how many marriages have been saved how many affairs have been mended how many depressions have been saved off how much angry how many angry young men and women have found a hearing and been able to forgive and move on with their life you know, a lot of people think, well, the church is all about a big budget and a, and a mega pastor and a mega church and a phenomenal worship team and, 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 you know, a beautiful sanctuary and TV cameras and 50,000 followers on Instagram. But I'm here to tell you today that the most powerful work that the church does, my friend, is done by simple people just like the good Samaritan who stumbled along somebody who's broken and hurting and who needs love and care and, and they take them in and love them and care, the, care for them and tell them about Jesus Christ. It is often done in restaurants and barbecues and, and family uh, uh, reunions. And I'll tell you, it's usually not done by preachers. It's usually done by ordinary followers of Jesus who share their life and testimony. And there's no one or nothing that can stop it. There's no one with that kind of power because it is a real movement. And in these days when we feel shut in, I have to tell you, everybody knows someone. You've got someone's phone number in your phone that you can give a call to, that you can love on and encourage and care about. My friend Bill Olson used to say, did you know that one word given in the right moment, in the right spirit, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, can change the destiny and the direction of someone's life? powerful thought. So my challenge to the church today is let's go forth into this world and let's bring hurting people into a community of people who will love them. I want to ask you a question this morning as we bring this message to a conclusion today. Maybe you're listening to this broadcast and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe you're not a believer in Jesus. Maybe you're from your, of some other faith. Or maybe you're just an agnostic or, or, or an atheist and you don't really believe. Listen, God's calling your name. He's reaching out to you today. And I want to tell you that He loves you. And He's got a plan for your life. But you've got to first accept Jesus Christ. You've got to answer the call. He's calling you out of darkness into His marvelous light today. He wants to transfer you from the kingdom of, uh, of, of the enemy into the kingdom of His dear Son. Now, if you need Jesus, I want you just to pray this simple prayer with me. Now, praying a simple prayer won't save you unless you pray it with faith believing. But if you pray with faith believing, I believe that your name can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life today. Would you follow me in this prayer? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I need Christ. I know that I need to be brought to the end where I can find healing. I know that I need Jesus. And so I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I need forgiveness. I need salvation. I need restoration. This world has wounded me and broken me, and I need forgiveness and healing. 
And so God, today with my mouth, I confess Jesus Christ. And in my heart, I believe that he's been raised from the dead. And so today, I make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, to become his disciple, to follow his word, to become a part of a Bible-believing congregation, and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer with faith and sincerity, I believe it can change your life. Let me pray for the congregation today. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take this message, God, that I've shared today and bring a sense of purpose to your people. Lord, we have a job to do. It's our job to pray. It's our job to seek your face. It's our job to call out. And Lord, we want to see a move of God in this generation, Lord. We want to see an outpouring of the Spirit. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves today on this Lord's day and we call out on you and we ask, Lord, that you would hear our pleas to heal our land. And Lord, we pray that you would deal with each one of us individually. God, that you would cause us to seek your face, to turn from everything that displeases you and to walk and live a life that's pleasing in your sight. And God, I pray that you would encourage your people today. Lord, I pray for those, Lord, who are struggling in, uh, through fears of coronavirus. I pray for those, Lord, who, who are wondering what the future holds. And I pray, God, that you would give them peace and encourage them today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say thank you today to everybody who watched this broadcast today. And know that Jereen and I, your pastors, we love you dearly. We can hardly wait to see you again. But we love you. Consider yourself all high in high regard and high esteem in, in, by, by us today. We love you. We thank God for you. Thank you for watching this, either on Facebook Live or on YouTube. And remember that we appreciate your financial support. And so may God richly bless you today. Have a great afternoon in Jesus' name. Amen.